Welcome to Bits and Bytes. In this episode, we're going to find out how you can hook up your microcomputer to other small computers so that you can become part of a little electronic network in your own neighborhood. We'll also show you how to tap the information contained in huge computers that may be thousands of miles away. Let's begin by having Billy Van get his computer to talk to another computer. Well, how do I do that? It's very easy. You just pick up the telephone. Well, how can a computer talk on a phone? Well, I admit it does need a little help. First of all, you need to load a communications program into it. There's one on a disc right beside the TRS-80. Vidtex. Oh, that's the communications program. Well, what does it do? Remember that your computer is a universal all-purpose machine. You can transform it into almost anything you like. In our last episode, you transformed your computer into a filing system by means of a file manager program. That's right, I remember that. Now you need to transform your computer into a communications terminal. So, you have to load a communications program into it. Which will tell it how to talk over the phone. Exactly. Okay. Now, how do I start it? Just press the orange reset button and it'll start automatically. The communications program is now being loaded into the computer. Now, here we go. CompuServe Information Service Executive. Does that mean I've gotten through to a computer already? No, no, not yet. That's just your computer signaling that it's ready. Now you can make the connection to another computer. That notepad beside you has a number of a local computer you can contact. Oh, okay, I'll try that. Well, there must be something wrong with the line. Oh, no, no, that's the sound of the computer at the other end, talking over the telephone. The sound of bits and bytes again, as on an audio cassette. That's it, but these tones have to be modified slightly to go over the telephone line. Oh, well, how can my computer hear this? See that flat black box beside you? Yes. Fit the telephone receiver into the two sockets. Okay, let's see, uh, phone cord this way. Now your computer will be able to hear messages and speak into the telephone itself. And this is all coming from Willowdale, Ontario? That's right. It's also going to Willowdale. That's to say, to another microcomputer at the other end. And right now, you've gotten through to a sort of electronic bulletin board. Your last name is Ben. Your first name, Billy. Yes, it certainly is. Thank you. What's an access code? It's a kind of password that's assigned to you, so the computer at the other end can be quite sure of the identity of the computer that's calling in. Your access code is written on that notepad. Oh, yes, here it is. So I just type this in, I guess. Can I leave a message? Sure, go ahead. I know, I'll do a commercial. Why not? All right, type L for leave. Okie doke. Who's the message to? Well, I'll say all. Enter a password? Just hit enter. Let everybody hear. Yes, it is correct. Now, these are the rules. <laughs> okay, here's the message. Hello. This is Billy Van. Don't Get to watch bits and bytes from 
T B O. Hit enter to end message. Okay. And then type S to save your message. S it is. Now, will anyone who calls in be able to read this message now? Oh, yes. I'll show you how you can check that it's on the board. To see the message, type R. Okay. Well, how do I find my message? It's the last number. Type I for individual and 3038. Uh, I for message and 3038. Enter. Hello, this is Billy Van. Don't forget to watch Bits and Bites from TV Ontario. Hey, this is a lot of fun. Are there many of these bulletin boards in use? There are hundreds of them all across North America, and thousands of people using them all the time. Hmm, I've never heard of them. And all you need is a computer, a communications program, and this little black box. That's all. Mind you, there are different types of black boxes. For example, the apple next to you. It's already hooked up to one that connects directly with the telephone jack. Oh, so I don't have to fit a telephone into this one? No, it bypasses the telephone completely. But both this black box and the one you used with the Tierra 80 are based on the same principle. They're both modems. Modems? It's a funny word. Yes, it is. Let's have a look at exactly what a modem is and how it works. The computer needs help in using the telephone. This is because computers and telephones don't talk the same language. The computer speaks binary code, ones and zeros, whereas the telephone speaks in a series of tones. So you need to put a special black box between the computer and the telephone to transform or modulate computer talk into telephone talk. Then whatever you type in at your computer can go out over the phone lines and be understood by any other telephone. But before that telephone can send your message along to a second computer, another sort of black box is needed to transform or demodulate telephone talk back into computer talk. So once computer A has a modulator and computer B has a demodulator, A can send messages to B. But this is only one-way communication. B still can't send messages to A. To make it two-way communication, computer B needs a second black box to modulate its owner's message to you from computer talk to telephone talk. And computer A needs a second black box to demodulate that message from telephone talk back into computer talk. But to save having to buy two black boxes for each computer, a modulator, and a demodulator, they can be combined into one box, a modulator-demodulator, or a modem. Once a computer is equipped with a modem, it can both send and receive messages to and from any other computer in the world that is also equipped with a similar sort of modem. You know, there is one thing that concerns me. I mean, if it's so easy for computers to have a chat with one another, what about the effect on privacy? I mean, is it possible for one computer, we'll say, to get in touch with my computer in the middle of the night and have a look at my income tax return or something else that's confidential? No, don't worry, it couldn't. Not if you think about it for a moment. Of course, I'd have to leave the computer on, the modem would have to be plugged in, with the phone line open. No, I suppose not. And even if your computer were on and the phone line were open, you probably wouldn't leave your income tax in the computer. You'd keep it in a cassette or disc. Yeah, I guess I would at that. But, well, it was just a thought. You know, the way information flows around so freely now. By the way, I wanted to ask, the bulletin board I use, is there a charge for that? No, most small bulletin boards are run by other microcomputer owners as a hobby. They're free of charge. They just do it for fun. But there are large databases you can get through to that do charge a small fee. Database, that's an electronic filing system, isn't it? Yes, but some of them are more like electronic encyclopedias that are updated every day. I'm going to show you how you can get through to a database called The Source. The Source? It's a very large database in McLean, Virginia. 
A communications program has already been loaded into the computer. And its modem is already plugged into a phone jack. Oh, but wait a minute, wait a minute. How can I possibly dial a number if we're bypassing the telephone? This modem will dial the number for you. That's why they're called smart modems. You just type in the number and then follow the instructions in the source manual. But to save time, we've already gotten through to the source for you. Okay, let's try item five, education and career. Oh, another menu. Ah, we're narrowing down the field. Ah, all right. Mathematics. Narrowing down. Oh, this is terrific. You work through menus, each one getting more and more specific. Okay, general mathematics. Oh, I see. I have to use the R command to begin the program. It's offering to do various calculations for me. Gee, this is great stuff. All right, to compute the distance which an object will fall, I type R, fall. Enter acceleration due to gravity. Uh, I'll say seven. Enter initial velocity. Again, I'll put seven, uh, just to see what happens. Oh, I get it. It calculates how far an object will have fallen after five, 10, 15 seconds, and so on. Hmm. And you say there's just a small fee for the use of this service? Yes, it's quite inexpensive. In fact, the hourly rate for getting this information is only a fraction of regular long-distance charges. These information utilities are quite a bargain. So then the source is actually an information utility, like uh, gas or electricity. <laughs> yes, or like water, information on tap. You know, it opens up all sorts of possibilities. But it's all still very new right now. We are at the beginning of electronic communication. To find out more about this, we talk to the people at the source. We see ourselves as a utility. We're not just a place where you get one kind of information, like business. It's movie reviews and consumer hints and household advice. We also provide communications, electronic mail, chat from coast to coast. It gives you computing power and games. It's a diverse database that lets you do a little bit of almost everything. It's a lot of fun. When most people think of the source, I think that they think of a big mother computer in the sky somewhere that is a repository for all of the world's information that's very friendly to use, that they can address in plain English and get responses in plain English. In reality, the source is six prime 750 computers here in McLean, Virginia, which provide a vast amount of information that they gather from other computers around the country, put into a standardized form, and make available to the general public. The source is really two networks in one. We use a local network that ties the computers together through a high-speed link that transfers voluminous amounts of information at one time. We also augment that local network with services we purchase both here and in Canada. That allows us to bring in calls from anywhere in the world directly into the source. Through multiplexing or through combining large numbers of calls, we can transfer these calls very economically. In the case of a long distance call, you are using a single device and a single transmission media to make a voice call. In the case of a data call, you're using, again, a single device, but your call is being combined and assigned a particular type of ID along with numbers of other calls at the origination point. Then at the point of destination, that call is being redeciphered by using that ID and forwarded to the proper user. That's the whole multiplexing technique, assigning an ID at the point of origin and using that ID at the point of destination 
to break that call apart from the other calls it's being transmitted with. By using statistical accounting methods, we've determined that all of our users will not call at any given time. So therefore, we've configured our lines to support the upper end of that statistical average. Signing on, I think, is the, the biggest problem that we have. Some people leave out spaces and we ask for a distinct format in signing on to the system. Other people have trouble in connecting to the network. A lot of times they might type in the wrong password. Some people don't know what their passwords are. Some people don't know what their account number is. So we try to explain that because that's one of the things that they'll be using continuously through their subscription. They can call this department 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Surprisingly, the typical subscriber to the source is not a person in the data processing or computer field. They are people who are business professionals, business owners, physicians, lawyers. There are many people from the media, writers, publishers on the system. And the one thing that they all share is a, an overriding interest in personal computing. All of them are involved trying to apply the phenomenon of personal computing to their own fields. A very large proportion of our source subscribers are educational users. And they find the ability to look up information electronically and then to move that information from our main computers into smaller microcomputers provides a very valuable tool for performing research and student demonstrations. Educators are using the source to teach their students that computers aren't the ogres that, they're, that they seem to be to the first user, that they're pretty easy and that they're pretty friendly and that you really can't blow things up by making the wrong command. We believe the source itself is an educational experience. It teaches you how to communicate, how to compute, how to exercise databases via the telephone. The source teaches people about the potentials of personal computing in a very straightforward, easy to understand way. You can learn modern languages through the source, do vocabulary tests and things like that. There are mathematical programs. We provide each of our subscribers with a pretty substantial user's manual. Easy to follow instructions, prepared under the guidance of our parent company, the Reader's Digest, which is known for its consumer orientation. People will call the source and via the telephone will download onto their microcomputer a computer-assisted instructional program, which then they will sign off so they no longer have to pay connect time rates. And then they will bring the disk up on their own microcomputer and go through whatever the educational material might be. We're constantly striving for increased simplicity and increased ease of use. We're always looking for better and faster ways to bring you the information that relates as specifically as possible to your needs. And that's part of the wonder of computers. It's part of the potential of it that we need to use more ourselves. And we're just learning along with everybody else. That's very interesting. Now let's see. Through this modem, I can send or receive data or programs. I can leave messages on bulletin boards or exchange information. But it must be very difficult to set up even a local network. No, not really. Would you like to set up a small network of your own? Oh, I'd love to. Well, that bulletin board that you used at the beginning is run by one man and one microcomputer. You're kidding. It's that simple? You mean I could set up a network of my own where people would call my computer? You could, but you don't always need a telephone to run a computer network. Well, how else could I do it? Well, the local network could be set up within a, a building, an office, a school, or a single classroom. We've lined up three computers in a row. And they've all been linked together by what is called a network controller. This particular one is a Muppet 2, made especially to go with the pet computers. Well, and I see they've all been wired together. So, this Muppet 2 lets these three computers talk to each other. It does to a certain extent, but mainly it allows the computers to share a single disk drive. 
Now, in front of you, there's a disc with an educational program on it. Put it into the disc drive. Okay. Type D-load, quote, volcano in each case. Okay. D-load, quote, volcano, quote. Okay. D-load, quote, volcano, quote. And D-load, quote, Volcano, quote, return. And now I suppose I type run? Right. Okay. There we go. Aha. Uh -huh. Now the same program is loaded into the RAM memory of all three computers. Well, that's very convenient. Yes, it is. Especially for a teacher who has only one disk drive and one copy of a program, but several computers in the classroom. Well, how many of these computers could be hooked up through this device? Fifteen in this particular one. But the number varies depending on the type of network controller that you have. So a great number of students could share the same program at the same time, but only using the one disk. That's right. And right. each student can use the program in a different way once it's loaded into his own computer. Let's try it, but give a different response to the program at each of the computers. Okay. First we'll set it up there. There's the volcano. Oh, oh, oh. Eruption. You are camped on the west side of Mount St. Helens. You hiked up from the end of a logging road where you left your car last night. There is an eerie quiet. No birds are singing. Suddenly you are shaken by an earthquake with a giant roar. The top half of Mount St. Helens explodes thousands of feet into the air. A dense cloud of black smoke expands and begins to move towards you. Oh boy, this is getting thrilling. All right, what should you do? Use your camping shovel and dig in. Take photos, they'll be worth lots. Start down the mountain to your car, get to high ground, try to find shelter, pick a number. Okay, well, I wonder how I make out with some photographs, all right. Photos, and over here, what would I do? Uh, I'd get to high ground, number four. And over here, what would I do? Try to find shelter, of course. Uh-oh, congratulations, you have taken some really spectacular photos, which will be printed in hundreds of newspapers. Posthumously. You are suffocated by hot gas from the side of the mountain. Is there no winning? You are too close to the hot ash for any shelter to be effective. Those who tried this were buried alive. Charming. Oh, well, you can't win them all. So it turns out that you can save money by sharing the same disc, but it doesn't mean that everyone has to do exactly the same thing. No, that's the beauty of it. In fact, students can use different programs from the same disc at the same time. They can share the same disc, but not necessarily the same program. So these three computers can communicate with the disc drive, but can they communicate with each other? Yes, on many of these networks, and the teacher and students can exchange messages. But there are so many different ways of moving messages about on these networks, it really gets confusing. It is confusing. So let's have a review of the different types of computer networks that we've experimented with so far. The simplest way to link computers together is via a network controller and a disk drive. This enables all the computers to load any of the contents of a single disk into their RAM memories. They can all load the same program, or each of them can load a different program from the same disk. The computers can also communicate with each other via the disk drive. This is an example of a local disk sharing network, which could link many computers together within a single building, whether it be a factory, an office, or a school. But computers can also be linked together over distance via a modem and a telephone. The simplest example of this is an individual microcomputer that lets its disk drive be used as a bulletin board, 
by any other computer that cares to call in to leave a message or pick up a message. Although many computers may use this type of network, the host computer is usually so small that only one guest computer can call in at a time. This is a typical small bulletin board network. But there is a third type of network whose host computer can be very large indeed, with enough computing power to run many disk drives at the same time, and therefore able to manage a large database with a tremendous variety of different sorts of data and programs stored in it. A giant host computer like this can move information between its own RAM memory and any of its disk drives at such high speed that even if dozens and dozens of small guest computers call in at exactly the same moment, it can dish out data or programs to them with only a split second pause between each customer. This is an example of a large database network. So those are three common types of computer network. Disk sharing, bulletin board, and large database. And not only are there a lot of computers around, but they're like an octopus. Their tentacles reach everywhere. Think of a computer network as just another service we can plug into, just as we plug into a telephone network. We all have telephones, so it won't be long before most of us have a computer. In a few years' time, all this will be taken for granted. I think I'll do a little more electronic browsing through the source. In our next episode, we'll see some of the differences between BASIC, APL, and COBOL. We'll find out how children are learning to program computers with a language called Logo. And we'll discover how interpreters and compilers work. An interpreter runs slowly, whereas a compiler lets it run very quickly and efficiently. I'm Luba Goy for Bits and Bytes. <laughs>